It was January 4th, 1858. And the newly elected mayor of the city of Worcester, the Honorable Isaac Davis, was giving a state of the city address. And the news wasn't good. He said, our citizens are far from prosperous in the various branches of industrial pursuit. Business is paralyzed. The busy hum of industry has died away from the shops of the mechanics and the artisans. And hundreds of laborers have been thrown out of employment and reduced to want. Sober tidings from the new mayor. Matter of fact, the city of Worcester had increased its appropriations for paupers significantly. The recession of 1858 had hit the cities of Providence, Worcester, and the entire Blackstone Valley extremely hard. And yet, by 1861, the Blackstone Valley was functioning at a, almost 100% manufacturing capacity. What changed? Well, what changed is probably one of the most critical, traumatic, and eventful periods of American history. Some historians call it our crucible of fire. Some people refer to it as the War of the Rebellion. Others, the War of Secession, depending on your vantage point. More commonly, it's known as, quite simply, the Civil War. And here in the Blackstone Valley, we were involved with the Civil War as much as anyone. While there were no battles here, the impact economically here was significant. And we're going to take a look at this very tremendous aspect of American history from our own little perspective here in the Blackstone Valley. And we're going to examine the Civil War from three specific vantage points in three different shows. The first one is going to be about the economic impact of the Civil War on the Valley, the Valley's role in support of the Union forces. And secondly, the second part we're going to take a look at is the soldier's life. What did the boys from Rhode Island and Massachusetts feel when they went all away from home for the very first time to fight a war? What was camp life all about? And lastly, the third part, we're going to take a look at the human interest side of the war. Because there are a lot of very romantic, moving stories that came from the Blackstone Valley that were important from understanding the entire war. Now, the Civil War was a tremendously bloody and deadly war. The advances in technology had outstripped the battlefield tactics significantly. And the Blackstone Valley played a role in that. So folks, join me, Chuck Arning, Ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, as we examine the economic impact of the Civil War on the Blackstone Valley. We're inside the Providence Tool Company in their lobby. And as you can tell from the architecture, this is truly dates back to the Civil War era, where it was a major manufacturing facility. The lentils, the windows, even the rope going up to the bell in the mill tower are very authentic and date back to that period. When you think about it, rifles to ramrods, horse blankets made out of rubber to uniforms, the Blackstone Valley had a tremendous impact on the Union effort during the Civil War. And there's no one more qualified to speak about the manufacturing aspects of the Civil War than the National Park Service's own eminent chief historian, author, and storyteller, Edwin Bars. Next to, or maybe as much as the manpower that they furnished to the United States Navy and the United States Army, uh, would be the technology. The Civil War is occurring at a time in which there's great progress, a great leap forward in technology. Thus, uh, just a few years before, they had adopted as a standard firearm in the United States Army a rifled musket. A rifled musket will have an effective range of 300 yards, a killing range at 750 to 1,000 yards, and it replaces a smoothbore musket that was no more effective than had been Brown Bess in the hands of His Majesty's troops at Bunker Hill or Breed's Hill, being in Massachusetts, whichever you want to call it. So the introduction of improved firearms, of course, 
reaching back to Eli Whitney and them, standardization uh, provides uh, this technology that's going to make killing much easier, make the Civil War a far deadlier war than occurred before, such as the Battle of Shiloh on two days, they will kill and wound more men than the British and Americans between them lose in the eight years of the Revolution. So they'll have the development of, different, of repeating firearms, the manufacture of bayonets, the expansion of the textile industry, looking for wool, for uniforms, to replace the cotton, which will be temporarily embargoed from the South. So these mill towns, the towns up in, uh, up, uh, the factories up in Worcester, where there's already a metal industry, in Providence, uh, will give uh, the Union the hardware with which they will use to finally defeat the South. The big advantage of the North is in technology the ability to mass produce, which the South does not have. And while the South starts off winning battles, the war as it progresses will end in one of staying power and production. And the North will win on that. Part of the success of the Blackstone Valley entrepreneurs was their ability to adapt and expand on their current manufacturing expertise in the development of new products. Now we're standing in front of the Providence Tool Company, what currently is known as the Rhode Island Tool Company, a division of Greystone, but during the Civil War this was a major manufacturing facility. Matter of fact, it took advantage of its expertise in machining and mass production and combined that with technological breakthroughs by local businessmen Brown and Sharps and Howe to manufacture 70,000 58 caliber Springfield rifles, the principal weapon of the Civil War, for the Union forces. Now, how was the Blackstone Valley able to adapt so quickly to new market conditions? Let's catch up with Al Kleiberg, director of the Rhode Island Historical Society, and find out. Al, just what impact was happening back in 1860, 1861? There was a tremendous impact here, Chuck. The, uh Mills uh, of the Blackstone Valley in Rhode Island and nearby Massachusetts were uh, already well established. Uh, this, of course, was the place where Mills began with Slater Mill in the 1790s. Uh, Mills had expanded uh, during the 1830s and 1840s, and of course, when the Civil War came along, many of the things that were already being produced uh, here were in, in great quantity or great requirement. Uh, things like uniforms for troops, uh, things like cannons, things like supplies, uh, even rubber blankets for horses and ponchos or whatever the equivalent was for, for troops and so forth. And uh, the mills of Rhode Island and Massachusetts responded to these, uh, uh, to these orders. And of course, uh, the government needed everything right away. Went from a very small professional army of only a set of, of only several thousands to requirements for almost half a million people under arms. They all needed uniforms, they all needed rifles, they all needed packs, they all needed everything. There are other manufacturing centers across the country, but southeastern New England uh, was, uh, was one of the most important and is one of the most available to Washington in that you could send things either by boat or by train, given the great harbors and, and, and boat lines of Fall River and Providence and, and so forth. Some of the factories in the valley uh, in Slatersville and other places that had made uh, scythes and cutting devices for cutting grain and corn and so forth uh, converted themselves into, uh, into making sabers, uh, for example. Uh, here in Providence, uh, the uh, Providence Tool Company uh, made various kinds of, of rifles. The, uh, uh, one of the most famous battles of the Civil War was the, the uh, ship duel between the, uh, the Monitor and the Merrimack. Uh, the Monitor, as you may recall, was a, was a, a, a small boat that had a, a, a very powerful uh, turret on it that could spin around. Well, what made it possible for that turret to spin around was that the great gear that turned that 
firing mechanism around 360 degrees was actually cast here in Providence uh, uh, at the Corliss steam engine uh, company. Another major manufacturer which just disappeared a few years ago, BIF or Builders Iron Foundry, uh, according to one report that I read on the history of the iron and steel industry, produced something like one, one third of all the cannon for the North. Uh, and uh, these were industries or these were companies that were not set up to be uh, munitions manufacturers to begin with, but they converted themselves. Uh, Builders Iron Foundry had started out making uh, uh, iron trusses and, and, uh, and railings and various architectural elements uh, for uh, uh, for houses, and uh, but when the war came along, uh, the demand was there for cannon, just as the demand was there for the one socket rubber company to make uh, uh, blankets and raincoats and boots and so forth. So uh, we we're used to these things taking a longer period of time, but in those days, if the demand was there, they they changed overnight. On the other hand, when the war was over, the Builders Iron Foundry was out of the cannon business. They had to do something else, and fortunately for them. Uh, they discovered that municipalities, cities, and towns across the country were needing devices for uh, community water systems. So they started making pipes, they started making pumps, and that sort of thing. So they solved that problem uh, more quickly than General Dyna Dynamics has solved the problem of what to do if we ever stop making submarines. If you go through the mills of the Blackstone Valley, uh, you will see the generation of mills that began about the time of Samuel Slater being primarily those built in a wooden architectural style. They almost look like barns with cupolas on them and, and stair towers and so forth. During the 1830s and 1840s, uh, the next generation of mills uh, were made out of rubble stone. They were made out of, of, of um, things that were quarried and, and put together with, with cement and so forth. But during and around the time of the Civil War, because of changes in architecture, uh, they started building their mills out of brick. And from the period of the Civil War on to the 1920s, you have all these brick mills. This was part of a forward-looking uh, entrepreneurship that was reflective in the way they made their factories as well as what they made in their factories. Well, one of the reasons why there were job opportunities were two reasons. One was, of course, that uh, the mills were expanding to meet the requirements of the government for all kinds of supplies. Uh, the second thing was that uh, just at the time when those, those orders were coming in, uh, to the mills and they were trying to put extra labor on, uh, many of their regular uh, permanent force was marching off to war. So uh, there became a tremendous uh, a change in the population in that there were thousands and thousands of uh, uh, French Canadian families, that, or first the, just the, the breadwinner who would come down and work in the factories in Pawtucket and Central Falls and Woonsocket and in some cases Providence. And the whole uh, social change was uh, the new population which developed uh, as part of, of the war and, and even today uh, a good part of the valley's uh, population makeup is from the descendants of those uh, French Canadians who came here beginning in 1861-1862. With mill activity at an all-time high, manufacturing equipment for the Union forces, and the fact that Rhode Island did not need a draft until very late in the war because it exceeded its troop allotments through voluntary efforts, who was working in the mills? Well, to find out that very interesting answer, let's catch up with Ranger Bob Bellows for our Blackstone Moment. Hello, I'm National Park Service Ranger Bob Bellows, and I'm standing in a unique village in the Blackstone River Valley. It's Albion, a village in the town of Lincoln in the state of Rhode Island. What makes Albion unique is that it's an entirely French-Canadian community. That's right, the population is entirely French-Canadian but it always wasn't so. This area in 1823 was inhabited by English Quakers who established a cotton spinning mill around 1823. Families such as the Wilkinsons of Pawtucket, the Harrises from Lime Rock Village, and also the Arnolds from Great Road all came here and invested in the beginning industrial heritage of the Albion Village. This area remained so until 1850 when the brothers Samuel and Harvey Chase, investors from Fall River, Massachusetts, bought the property and village and began to expand their textile empire. The Chases enlarged the mill up to 400 feet in length and also with this expansion also needed a larger workforce to come work these mills. As many of the original English and Irish inhabitants of the Albion village were off fighting the southern states, a new workforce was required to replace them. 
and the French Canadians were eager to come and work in the mills, finding their lot here a lot better off than their dismal agricultural experience they were having in the province of Quebec. Along with the large influx of French Canadians, there also evolved a number of social institutions which would help support their culture and their people. Foremost among those would be the establishment of a Catholic church. Again, faith and language would be the major foundations of the French Canadian people. St. Ambrose Church, it was established in 1895. Albion continued to grow in population, the major influx of French Canadians coming between the years 1880 and 1910. Even with the influx of two world wars and major sociological changes throughout the United States, the village of Albion remained entirely a French Canadian enclave. So much so that you could actually pick up this village and replace it in Quebec and it would fall easily in place with some of the many farming communities in that province. This has been National Park Ranger Bob Belrose here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor hoping to see you somewhere along the Blackstone. Have you ever wondered where the term Yankee ingenuity came from? Well, here in New England, we've always prized education. And early on, we made sure that our children were schooled longer than any other region in America, or any other country for that matter. The result was, that of the 143 major inventions patented in the United States between 1790 and 1860, 93% were done in the free states. And of that 93%, over half were done here in New England. The result was that you had a working population that was always tinkering, always trying to find ways to make their jobs a little easier and a little bit more efficient. They had the mental flexibility of seeing new relationships that allowed them to adapt to a changing economy. And the development of the Blackstone Valley from an industrial standpoint bears that history out. Now I'll tell you what, let's catch up with Mike Moore, historian for the Worcester Historical Museum, and Ron Borgeson, a gun collector and a volunteer at the museum to learn a little bit more about manufacturing during the Civil War era. Mike, we're standing in front of one of the more historical buildings here in Worcester. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a building known as the Junction Shops, and it was built in the decade before the Civil War. Uh, and it was one of, it's the oldest factory building still standing in Worcester. Uh, and it was built um, as a place that uh, small entrepreneurs could, uh, could rent space and power out of. So um, by the time that the Civil War started, this building was home to uh, a whole, no a dozen or so uh, Worcester manufacturers, including a couple of the machine tool businesses that uh, made a significant contribution to the war. Now Worcester had tremendous growth during this time frame, didn't it? Yeah, I, both, both in terms of, uh, of population and in terms of manufacturing uh, employment and output, uh, Worcester saw tremendous growth during this period. If you look at statistics for Worcester in 1855, four years after this building was built, um, and you compare it to the end of the war, in 1865, you have nearly a doubling in the number of people involved in manufacturing to nearly to, to more than 9,000, and nearly a tripling in the value of the product that they that they produce. And um, it did a the war did a couple of things in terms of Worcester manufacturing, and Worcester did a few things in terms of its contribution to the war. Uh, Worcester had the beginnings of a significant machine tool industry uh, by the time the war started. And many of Worcester firms made the machines that made the guns uh, and made the machines that uh, made the machine tools uh, that made the other implements and articles that were required for the war. Out of this building, the Wood Light and Company uh, and Shepherd Lathe uh, and Company both made machines uh, for the Springfield Armory uh, and for local uh, iron manufacturers uh, that were used in the production of arms, uh, some of which we can show you. For the first time in 1865, you see that machines and the metal trades come to be uh, the major industry in Worcester. Now, Worcester is known as a city of diversified industries, so they contributed in a lot of different ways to the war effort uh, and developed in a lot of different ways after the war. But I think uh, you can see that by 
by the Civil War's end that the machine tool industry in Worcester um, has developed into something that's going to be one of the engines driving uh, Worcester's growth and Worcester's manufacturing. Worcester had uh, a long history of especially woolen manufacturing along the streams uh, and rivers that, that make up the headwaters of the Blackstone here in Worcester. Uh, and in the 1850s, that, that industry was pretty stagnant here. Uh, and it wasn't growing much at all. Uh, and during the war years, it grew dramatically. Uh, in manufacturing clothing for, for, uh, for soldiers' uniforms and that sort of thing. So you have more than twice as many firms making four or five times as much cloth uh, after the war as you did before. Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. Now one of the things we're going to do now is we're going to catch up with Ron Borgensen, who's a member of the staff of the Worcester Historical Museum, to talk about some of the artifacts that are actually produced here in the valley and were used during the war, as well as understand a little bit more of what the technology was and the battlefield tactics. So let's track down Ron. I think any, any talk concerning the Civil War, people have got to understand how severe that war was. And then one way that you can understand that is you go walk through the Worcester Common, there's the Soldiers' Monument, and on that monument there's 398 names from soldiers and sailors who died from, from Worcester who died in the Civil War. Considering that Worcester had a population of only about 21,000 people at that time, and you can understand that there wasn't a neighborhood or, or even a street that wasn't affected by that war. And then, and then just one more example about how bad the war was is the Battle of Antietam. September 1862, Antietam, Maryland. The casualty rate in one single day is the greatest rate of deaths that the United States has ever, ever suffered in the war. The second next one would be D-Day plus an additional five days to reach the casualty numbers that the United States had at Antietam in 1862 in that Civil War. It was a severe type of a war. And one of the reasons why it was so severe, we're holding in our hands, isn't it? Ninety percent of the people that were battle deaths were killed by the rifled musket. Now, Ron, these particular weapons, are, you mentioned they're rifled muskets. What's That's the right. difference between a smoothbore musket that our colonial ancestors used and a rifled barrel? Well, one of the things that had to be done with the uh, muskets of the day, starting off with the smoothbore, is the ball had to be rammed down. And then in order to get that ball to ram down, it had to be smaller than the diameter of the, of the barrel. As a result of that, when it was fired, not being a tight fit within the barrel, the ball would kind of bounce along microscopically on its way out the barrel. And it would go off in the direction based on the last bounce. Its accuracy was poor, and as a result of no gas check, its, its uh, length of travel was pretty low. But then when you get into the rifled musket, it was going down easy. This, this particular rifled musket is rifled. It's got one turn and 72 inches. And what it would do, easily to load with a ramrod, this is the mini ball that would go down, push down with the ramrod, and then on the, on the instant of firing, the soft lead projectile, the base would immediately expand, grip the rifling, and then start that twist as it was coming out for increased length, increased accuracy. And, and, and a parallel to that would be throwing a football. You can throw a football, and as it spirals, you get greater accuracy, greater distance. But if it was just lobbed, heaven only knows where that football is going to go. But on the manufacture of this gun, this particular one is called the Model 1861 Springfield. It was made in 1862 in the Springfield Arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. In the history of Worcester, there was a shop called the Nathan Washburn Shops. And his contract to Springfield during the war was for five tons of rifle barrel iron per day. Kind of hard to imagine that in those days, five tons of rifle barrel iron per day. So it's conceivable that this barrel was made out of steel that came out of uh, the Washburn shops in Worcester, which is about maybe a mile or so from here. What he would do is he would roll the iron into sort of a long bar. And then Springfield would then bore it, rifle it, and finish the outside shape. 
His contract also was for 200,000 rolled bars of rifle barrel iron to the different contractors. Now, the different contractors in the Civil War would then buy the rifle barrel iron from Washburn, and one of them would be Providence Tool Company in Providence, Rhode Island. And the government needing rifles so badly during the war because all they had was the old smoothbore musket and anything they could buy from Europe is that they gave contracts to 32 different companies in the country at that time to make rifle muskets. Providence Tool, Providence, Rhode Island was one of them. Now this is a, a weapon, this Springfield was probably was made in Providence at the Providence Tool Company. It's called the Model 1861. It's a contract musket made by Providence Tool Company, Providence, Rhode Island. Providence Tool Company was one of the prime contractors to the government in the Civil War for rifled muskets. As a matter of fact, they made 70,000 of these uh, from 1862 to 1865. They got their, some of their uh, barrel iron from uh, Washburn and Worcester, but not having enough, they did supply some, some more supply to them from England. So that barrel could conceivably have come from, uh, uh, from the uh, Washburn shops or even from England. But one interesting thing about the quality of that gun, the government gave $20 a piece to the contractors who made the uh, rifle musket if it met specifications. And then as an interesting point to that $20, the United States Arsenal in Springfield was able to manufacture one for $8. So the $20 was certainly a, 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 an incentive to manufacturers to set up a system to make rifle muskets. That $20 was based on one that was absolutely perfect. If there was some defect in it, the government would subtract some types of some money. The average price paid to Providence Tool was $19.90, which says that virtually every one of the guns they made was absolutely perfect, except a few flaws that, that had something to do with appearance. But it's a perfectly splendid musket. As you continue down the Blackstone Valley, of course, you go through Millbury, and there's the Waters Company. Now, the Waters Company had been making guns since about 1803, and in the 1850s, they sold most of their equipment, so they no longer were in the gun manufacturing business, but they did make ramrods and bayonets. An example of a bayonet that could very well have been made by the Waters Company is here. These are all generic, so there's no telling who made it, but at any rate, it was all part of that soldier's equipment in the Civil War that would go on the end of his gun in such a manner. A British industrialist traveling throughout the United States back in 1854 commented that there wasn't a working boy of average ability throughout the New England states that didn't have some idea of a mechanical invention or improvement in a manufacturing process by which in good time he couldn't better his position or rise in fortune or social distinction. Now that concept of hope is as valid today as it was back in the mid-1800s. The feeling that you have an opportunity to be successful by hard work and ingenuity was a critical aspect to New England's economic rise. And this is seen in the rapid response the Blackstone Valley industrious had to meeting the country's wartime demands. The manufacturing sites in the Blackstone Valley played an important role in the Union effort during the Civil War. Now this has been Ranger Chuck Arning with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Board of saying we surely hope you enjoyed the look at manufacturing during the Civil War era. Now I'll tell you what, what happened to those boys from Rhode Island and Massachusetts who went off to fight? What was camp life all about? Well, I'll tell you what, catch us later and we'll tell you. <laughs>